Well, we've uh, been watching Jesus as he continues to unfold the proposition that he is indeed uh, God himself. God incarnate. God come to walk among us as he came and walked with Adam and Eve uh, some thousands of years earlier. And we've seen that as he reveals himself uh, to be God, to be the one where all power and authority is vested, uh, there are a couple of very different reactions. Uh, some of the folks uh, believe and welcome him with open arms as the Messiah. And you remember last week we talked about the distinction of the concept of Messiah from uh, Judaism and Christianity. Uh, because Judaism, when they talk about the Messiah, he is not God. He is just an exceptional man, an exceptional individual. In Christianity, when we use the word Messiah, we talk about Jesus Christ, Lord, and God. And so it's a, a little different concept there. So every time uh, Jesus reveals himself as God, the, the Pharisees uh, are really put off by that. In fact, you saw that they, they would like to stone him for that. And uh, it's just amazing to me uh, that their reaction. So Jesus has been using a method to reveal himself where he essentially breaks the rules. It was against the rules for him to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. He could have said to the paralytic, you're healed, get up, take your bed and go home, and everything would have been fine. But because he used a term that is reserved only for God himself, the Pharisees uh, were very put off by that, to say the least. And he's revealing himself to be God. So, when is it okay for we as Christians to, to break the rules? It's kind of a dangerous question, isn't it? Yeah, because it, oftentimes our minds immediately go to, well, what rules are you talking about? And how far can we take this thing? You know, every once in a while, uh, you run into some uh, so-called Christian kooks. And they say, well, we don't have to pay taxes because, you know, that's government thing and we only pay taxes to God. Yeah. And, uh, but what did Jesus say? Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Render to God what is God. So Jesus says, pay your taxes. And by the way, those fellows that tell you not to usually end up in prison. So that's, it's not a, not, not a good thing to do. But I think the first question we have to ask when we are about to consciously break a rule or a law or a regulation is, why am I doing this? In other words, what is the condition of my heart? Because we know from uh, the story in 1 Samuel chapter 16 where Samuel is, is sent to anoint the, the new king the, of Israel and uh, Jesse's sons are brought out to him and, and the, the first one just looks great and, and he figures this has got to be the guy and God says no that's not the guy he says because I look on the inside man looks on the outside so God looks at the intentions of our hearts and he will judge our rule breaking and we all break the rules at some time or other uh, he will judge it more by what is the intention of our heart than what our actual action is let me give you a, a couple of examples. Uh, during World War II, it was against the law in Europe to help the Jews evade the Nazis. But what does God's law say? God's law says, after loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. God's law says, you will help them evade the Nazis. So, we break man's law in order to fulfill God's law. There are instances where that is absolutely appropriate. In Acts chapter 5 uh, verse 29 we have Peter's famous response when they were forbidden not to speak of Jesus anymore and his response was well that's fine but we must obey God rather than men. And of course they were told to go into all the world and tell the folks about Jesus. So there are times when law breaking can be a positive thing. Well, what about sacramental law? But what about religious law? 
Uh, you know, those are th things that we have come uh, to observe over the years. When can we break those? Such as, it's Sunday morning, and by golly, if you're a Christian, you ought to be in church. And I agree with that statement. I'm a churchman. And I think we ought to be in church. And when I accepted the Lord, I was at church every time the door was open. And that happened to be in the, the uh, venue I was worshiping, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening. And on the few occasions I had to miss, I just, oh, I was, I was upset. Because I wanted to hear what the pastor had to say. Because I wanted to know about God and I wanted to be with God's people. So, uh, I firmly believe that's where a Christian ought to be. But, there are times when it's okay not to be at church. There are times when it's okay to do things a little differently than we've always done them. And wh what we have to be able to separate is, what is, the, or what was this law intended to do? Was it intended to enslave us? Or was it intended to free us? And we'll answer that question as we go along. Religious law and God's law are not necessarily the same thing. Religious law is, is the trappings and things that we have uh, come to observe. Uh, the rituals and, and that. And I like those things. For the most part, I think they are good. They keep us grounded. They, they remind us that we do have a, a very rich and, and wonderful past as a church. And we need to celebrate those things and remember those things. But we are not to be ruled by those things. Now, this passage, especially the first part that Mike read, is probably the, the most well-known passage on law-breaking. Uh, where Jesus breaks the Sabbath. Okay. But here's the, here's the catch to that. Was he really breaking the Sabbath? What did the, the law say about the Sabbath? You see what had happened over, over the, the years is the rabbis and the religious leaders had, with good intentions now, uh, taken on uh, the duty of uh, sort of sharpening up God's law. And they were adding things to it, again for good intentions, but it had come to the place where it was no longer as given by God, but it was as given by the religious leaders. And they thought they were improving on God's law. But God's law, since it came from God, is what? It's perfect. Can you improve on perfection? No. So every time we go to improve on something God has already laid out, all we do is muck it up. Yeah. But it's, that seems to be our tendency. We, we, we like to add to and add to and add to. Though not found in Scripture, these additions that the rabbis had put in eventually became as binding as scripture itself. And it's important to remember that. These additions are not found in scripture. Now I know I drive my guys crazy sometimes in the Wednesday morning Bible study because we'll take an issue that maybe we all believe, maybe we don't all believe that we've been taught for years and I will challenge us and I'll say, well now, where does it say to do that in scripture? Well, it, it doesn't, but we've always done it. And we've always been taught to do it. Well, that's okay, and it's okay to do it. Again, remember, I like ritual, I like uh, repetition. But we need to differentiate between Scripture and tradition. Tradition is good. What was the guy's name in Fiddler on the Roof? You know, tradition. I, I'm with him. But tradition... The obedience to tradition is volitional. Okay? Obedience to God is mandatory. So we need to keep the two separated. So let's look and see how Jesus is going to handle this issue. If I could get my Bible to cooperate with me here. Quit flying around. Okay, Mike read this passage for us, so I won't read it all. 
But we are free. But what are we free to do? That begs the next question. What are we to use this freedom for? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13, 14, and 18. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we're freed from the law when we're led by the Spirit to do what? To serve one another. Where it's back to that principle that we keep coming to over and over and over. People are more important than protocol. People are more important than the Sabbath. That's what Jesus said at the, at the end of this passage, you see. The Sabbath was made for people. People weren't made for for the Sabbath. And it's easy to get those things turned around. Now Jesus has been demonstrating his power over both the physical and the spiritual world. We've seen that. He's cast out demons. He's healed uh, uh, diseases. So he's established that. He even proclaimed himself to be God by forgiving sin. And this, as we said, really upset the rabbis and the re religious leaders. Why did it upset them so much? Here was a man in their midst proving himself to be God. Now, wouldn't you think they'd be kind of excited about that? I mean, here he is. Doing all this stuff. This is great. Hey, we're your right-hand men. We're the rabbis. We're the, we're the Herodians. We're the Pharisees. Uh, we're with you. But just the opposite was the case, wasn't it? Because he didn't fit the mold they were looking for. For well, one thing the Messiah would have been in Jewish structure is he would have obeyed the law to a T. And Jesus, as we've seen, doesn't do that. He spends his time casting out demons, healing diseases, forgiving sins. In other words, he spends his time serving people. They didn't like that. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a great military leader. They wanted a, a, a great king who would restore Israel to its earlier glory. And instead, they got a servant. Kind of a letdown for them. Now we say, well, I could never do that. I would never do that. But really? I think sometimes we do that. Not to the extent they did, but sometimes we do that. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Maybe you've made a theological statement and they come back with, well, I could never serve a God like that. You've heard people say things like that, if not that exactly. Well, I've read the Old Testament and you know, it kills all these people. And, uh, I could never serve a God like that. What are they doing? They're doing the same thing the religious leaders did. They're making God to be who they want him to be rather than who he is. And therefore, they're worshiping an idol. Because anything less than the true God is an idol. Someone said, God made man in his own image. And ever since, man has been trying to remake God in our image. There's truth there, isn't there? Now, we don't do that in big ways, but sometimes we do that in small ways. We need to try not to do that. So here we have him on the Sabbath going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, the disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying, look. Why are they doing what is unlawful to do on the Sabbath? Two things here to note. First, they are not really breaking the intent of the Sabbath. Because if you go back into Exodus and Leviticus and read uh, with the law of the Sabbath, the law strictly forbid harvesting your crops on the Sabbath. 
But were they harvesting crops? No. No. When they harvest the apples up in Hood River, they bring in the workers, they bring in the pickers, and they go out in the field and they harvest and they get paid for it. When the farmer goes out and picks an apple off the tree and enjoys it, is that the harvesting? No, not in, not in that sense. So they weren't truly breaking the intent of the Sabbath. And second, they were hungry. They had a genuine need. They were hungry. They needed nourishment. It's okay, you see, to take care of yourself. Sometimes we have needs. I mean, there may be even a time when it's a Sunday and we haven't had, we've been working hard at, for weeks at work and we haven't had time off and we're just all jumbled up and what we need to do is just get away. We'll go. You know, and fortunately we live in a place where we don't have to go very far to have sur find, surround ourselves with serenity and beauty and the things of God. Is that breaking the Sabbath? No. That's taking care of yourself. Now when we say those things, we have to remember that though, though, that's, though that's permissible, it should be the exception rather than the rule. Generally, we should be together on Sunday mornings. But there are times when maybe what we need is to get away. It's okay. It's okay to take care of yourself. Now you have to get a kick out of what uh, Jesus does next. He turns to these guys and he says to them, now they just said this is unlawful. He says to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. Now David did break the law, because this bread had been consecrated, and now it was unlawful for any man to eat it. But David was hungry, and his men were hungry, and he goes in, and he eats the bread. And so, when Jesus says, haven't you read about David? He, he's, he's really slapping him in the face because these guys are the Bible experts. See? That'd be like taking a Chuck Swindoll or somebody and saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't even read the scriptures. Be insulting, you see. There was a John G. Mitchell. He was one of the founders of uh, Multnomah Bible School over here across the river. And uh, he used to have, have the, he was a great scholar, and he used to do this thing to his students sometimes when they'd, they'd have some goofball answer to something they should have known in scripture. And he'd just kind of lean over at him and say, you know, don't you people ever read your Bibles? And I don't know if it's still there or not, but they used to have a plaque out in the yard that said that at, at Multnomah. And, that's really what Jesus is saying to these guys. He says, you're ignorant. Don't, you don't even know the scriptures yourselves. And yet you expect everybody else to adhere to them. David was the greatest hero that they had. And yet he did the very thing that they're condemning Jesus for. And he said to them, oh, before, let me get ahead of myself, how David entered the house and ate the bread and also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's an interesting concept, isn't it? The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You see, where God had set people free, the rabbis had put them in chains. Okay. God had set them free by giving them the Sabbath. It was one of the ways he set them free. And the rabbis had enslaved them. And then Jesus says another one of those statements that we just read it and blow, it, blow on by it. It doesn't really mean much to us. 
But to the rabbis, again, this is really going to set them on, on their ear. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He's Lord even of the Sabbath. So he's saying, I created this thing, the Sabbath, and therefore I have authority over it. And what I created it for was to serve you, not for you to serve it. So Jesus, now having declared his authority over the Sabbath and creation, now he's going to go on to display his authority over the Sabbath. So he proclaims it, he sets up the proposition, and now he's going to demonstrate the truth of that proposition. And we have chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. So, as he continues to drive his point home, that he is Lord over all, what does he do? He enters the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. Now he, he has demonstrated he's Lord of the Sabbath out in the field. Now he's going to demonstrate he's Lord of the Sabbath even in the synagogue itself. Notice the situation here. And they, that's the, the Pharisees, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They're watching him. They're waiting for him to make a slip. And I've seen people do that. They will, they will watch other people, just waiting for them to slip up so they can, ah, see there what you've done? See what you did? Don't do that. What you want to do, and I'm talking about in a church context, people do this. What you want to do in a church context is have your eyes where? fastened on God. Because here's the deal. And I don't know where this saying came from. It's not in Scripture. But it appears to be true in my experience. You generally find what you're looking for. And if you're watching somebody waiting for them to slip up, believe me, they will. Because we all do. It won't take long. So instead, maybe watch people, if you want to watch people, to see where you can see God in their lives. To see where you can see the good that they might do. But these Pharisees, they were looking to see Jesus slip up. To see him break their so-called law again. When is it okay to break the Sabbath? Well, let's, let's uh, bring it home a little bit. Let me give you a couple of scenarios. There, there are many more. But let me just give you a couple. You're talking to your neighbor who isn't a Christian and you invite him to church. And he says, well, someday, but this Sunday I, I have to re repair the water pump on my car. I'm having a problem with it. So I can't go. Or, you're talking to your neighbor and you invite her to church. And she says, well, I, I can't go to church. It, I've been just swamped at work lately and, and I need to get some stuff done at home and uh, I, I just have to take a day and, and get the house back in order. Your probable response is, okay, well, I'll, I'll ask you again sometime. But what if you responded like this? If you're in the car repair scenario, what if you said, well, hey, I'm assuming you have some ability in those areas. You wouldn't want me helping you. But what if you said, instead of, okay, I'll ask you again sometime, what if you said, you know what? I, I'm pretty handy around uh, mechanics. I'll, take, I'll just take Sunday off from church and come over and help you. Oh. Or, if you're, you're a lady and you're talking to the lady, what, what about, well, you know what? How about if I just take Sunday off from church and I'll come over and help you clean? Or maybe you could take it even a step further in either scenario and you could call a few other Christian guys or gals from the church 
and recruit them. Which one do you think would be more pleasing to Jesus? Which one would have the most impact on the person you're, you're dealing with? I think it would be the scenario where you skip church and help them take care of whatever pressing need they had. Now here's what would happen if you do that. The religious leaders of our time, the Pharisees in our church, or in whatever church you in, would condemn you for that. I think Jesus would commend you for that. You see? Because you had an opportunity to demonstrate Christ's love in serving that person by fixing his car, cleaning her house, whatever it is you're doing. And you took it. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is talking about when he said the Sabbath is made for man. Because I think most times your need on the Sabbath is to be in church. But there are times when you, you, are, you have opportunity to serve others and help others. I think that's the better choice. And that's coming from a guy that thinks you ought to be in church. It's always the better, church, the better choice. Jesus continues to jab at these guys. Verses 3 and 4. And he said to the man with a withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, the Pharisees, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save a life or to kill? And look, look what, what was their response? They were silent. Because they wanted to say, It's illegal to even do good. But they knew that wasn't a good answer. So they're just silent. They have no response. Now, and he, Jesus, looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. Wow. That would make everybody rejoice, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, not quite. Jesus is angry with these guys now. And that, the, the word that's used there is one that uh, is, is a real intense anger, a passionate anger. It, it, you know, it's like he's saying, what's wrong with you guys? And of all the people that should know, you should know. And you don't. But now there's an interesting thing here. And then it says, he looked around, he was angry and grieved. And the word, the word grieved has the idea there of he, was, he felt sorry for them. He, he had compassion for them even though he was angry with them because he felt sorry for them that their hearts were hardened. That they were so judgmental and so ruled by all these rules. So he was both angry and sad at the same time. And I think sometimes he feels that way with us. In fact, uh, you know, I, I think we may get before the Lord and he might just shake his head in compassion and say to us, you know, I didn't intend for it to be so hard. But we make it hard. You know, God makes it pretty simple. But we make it hard. Jesus is angry at their hypocrisy, but at the same time has compassion for their hardened hearts. And then finally in verse 6, the Pharisees went out immediately, held a council with the Herodians against how to destroy him. They are in the very presence of God, and rather than embrace him, they want to destroy him. Isn't that a shame? It's no wonder Jesus felt sorry for them. And yet there are times we do the same. So, the big thing again that we learn is that people are more important than rules. People always come first. Jesus said again, the Sabbath was made for men, not man for the Sabbath. The laws and rules that God has given us 
were never meant to enslave us, but to free us. Not free to be self-serving people, but free to serve others. And that's what it's all about. And I think if we had more Christians on Sunday serving other people, we might see a lot more results in our efforts to tell people about Christ, to tell people about Jesus. And so, uh, I give you all permission to miss church anytime you are missing, now here's the important part, anytime you're missing to either take care of a legitimate need in your life or meet the need to serve others. That's a good thing. Okay? Now if I come to church next week and it's empty, <laughs> I'm going to know there's a whole lot of serving going on out there. <laughs> well, that could be a legitimate need. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Father, thank you that you have indeed freed us from the tyranny of the law. Not that the law in itself is a bad thing, that what we do with it oftentimes is a bad thing. Lord, thank you for setting us free. Free to serve one another. Free to serve others that you might uh, bring into uh, our realm. Lord God, as we think about the Sabbath, we call it that sometimes. It's really the, the day that you created to give us an opportunity to rest and refocus and relax. And I believe for us Christians... Generally, the best way to do that is to come into your presence with fellow Christians. But sometimes you give us opportunities to reach beyond ourselves. And I pray that you would give us the heart and the desire to seize those opportunities. And as we do that, we will truly demonstrate your love for others. We ask your blessing on our week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.